Welcome, everyone, to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News, and it's so great to have you all with us. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These, as we all know, are the immortal lines uh, to Emma Lazarus's famous poem, which is enshrined on a bronze plaque on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Often seen as a beacon of welcome to people around the world, the poem reaffirms one of the most sacred principles of our national mythology. America, we have been reminded throughout our lives, is a nation of immigrants, a new world where freedom and opportunity seekers from all corners of the globe can come to pursue their potential and live in a nation that is ostensibly defined by its commitment to safeguarding citizens' right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is certainly the national mythology that I grew up with, and it is certainly what drew my ancestors to this country from Mexico, Italy, and elsewhere. It should be no surprise, however, that the mythology of America as a nation of immigrants has a very complex political history. And studying the history of how and why this mythology emerged can actually tell us a lot more about America than the myth itself. That is precisely what our guest today, the brilliant Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, has done in a masterful new book entitled Not a Nation of Immigrants. Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion, which is out now from Beacon Press. And in this book, which uh, is right here and that I would highly recommend that everyone go check out, Roxanne writes, quote, the United States has never been a nation of immigrants. It has always been a settler state with a core of descendants from the original colonial settlers, that is, primarily Anglo-Saxons, Scots-Irish, and German. The vortex of settler colonialism sucked immigrants through a kind of seasoning process of Americanization, not as rigid and organized as the, quote, seasoning of Africans, which rendered them into human commodities, but effective nonetheless, end quote. And to dig into this book, to, to unpack, uh, as she does so beautifully in the book, uh, this national mythology and the political uses that it serves. I'm honored to be joined by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz herself today on the Real News Network. For those who don't know, um, you know, Roxanne is someone who needs no introduction, but I will give you a short one uh, right now. Uh, Roxanne grew up in rural Oklahoma in a tenant farming family. She has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. She is a world-renowned historian, uh, winner of the 2017 Lannan Cultural Freedom Prize, and she has authored and edited numerous books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which won the 2015 American Book Award, and Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Roxanne, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Maximilian. It's wonderful to be back on real time and with you. Well, we're so honored to have you back here. And um, yeah, I mean, I, my mind is just going in a different million different directions after reading your book. And, you know, I think the, the real test will be kind of keeping us focused <laughs> right on, on kind of the essential points and ultimately encouraging viewers and listeners to go out, read the book and, and let us know what y'all think about it. And so I figured maybe by way of like entering this sort of like important vast world that you explore in your book, I was wondering if you could kind of walk us through the origins of this nation of immigrants myth, right? Because I know that for me growing up, it just felt like just such a, an integral, almost ontological part of what America was, but you detail how, you know, it's actually a relatively new phenomenon and it's been kind of shaped in very kind of important ways for important reasons. So I guess where where did this sort of mythology of America as a nation of immigrants come from and how was it constructed? Yeah, even when I had um, reeled against this for many years, I wrote a, um, 
what I call kind of a rant, but back at that time in the early 2000s, they called it a, um, a blog <laughs> that uh, Monthly Review published, uh, Stop Saying This is a Nation of Immigrants. I myself, until I took it on as a project uh, a few years ago, uh, did not know that it just hadn't, you know, it was just one of those sayings that you don't know where it really came from or some songs like folk songs that it, it's just always been around. But actually, uh, it was in my youth, you're much younger than me. So it uh, clearly you would think it was, uh, you know, they had been there all your life and even before but I'm much older and um, I was pretty aware uh, in that period of time or soon after of, uh, and the sixties came pretty quickly uh, and I was very involved. I did not know that it was actually dated 1958, that it had an origin date. And that was, uh, it was a book published by John F. Kennedy. Um, in 1958, when he was senator from Massachusetts and preparing to run for president. And, you know, his father had always dreamed, uh, uh, I think the older son was supposed to be the one, but he was killed in the war, World War II. Uh, so John was the uh, second in line to promote to that role. So it was a really long chance and he barely won uh, because never before had there been a child of immigrants uh, or, and certainly not a Catholic ever uh, be president. And um, that uh, was a big hurdle uh, for him to do. So I think it was more of a, a piece of propaganda for building up to, for normalizing, um, normalizing uh, immigration. Every other president had been either Anglo or Scots-Irish, Anglo-American or Scots-Irish-American. Uh, the Scots-Irish were the people who, uh, the Scots uh, who um, colonized, uh, did settler colonialism in Ulster. Still today, uh, a major, a major issue, um, uh, the troubles of Ulster, Northern Ireland, uh, breaks out into war now and then, um, but they only got 50-50 there. But many of those um, seasoned settler colonialists were among the early settlers in the 13 colonies, and especially uh, populate Appalachia, like 90% of Appalachia today um, are descendants. So these characteristics, um, I, I don't think that Kennedy from the book that I get, I don't get the idea that he understood US history at all. Um, so he, he just deals with mainly um, with Irish famine refugees and the, the tragedy and sorrows and how they became great citizens and became police and so forth. <laughs> Uh, upstanding citizens, you know, naming them and building up a case for basically for Irish immigration. So he mentions others, uh, but only in, you know, a few words like about the uh, Chinese, of course, the first, um, the first immigration act of the United States was in 1883. And it was Ch the exclusion of Chinese, this Chinese exclusion act. Um, he apparently didn't know that, <laughs> hadn't bothered to look up any history of the um, of immigration to the United States. And uh, and he he says that the Chinese, they came with their gentle dreams, um, you know, whereas they were treated horribly, they were not allowed to be, they were undocumented, uh, they had no rights whatsoever, they were exploited, they were killed. Um, deported uh, everything, you know, and, until the 1940s when, when um, uh, there was some opening and then 1965 um, opened to more Asian immigration. So it's, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's really a propaganda piece, but I was very interested in under, uh, seeing that not only did he understand 
did not understand settler colonialism. He made little of uh, native people. Um, he has a longer passage about native people than you know any other people, uh, <clears throat> building up to calling them the first immigrants. He actually he actually writes a um, a myth that is a uh, a myth in Ireland. There are many myths like this of who discovered America. So this, this white nationalist myth uh, that comes from Celtic uh, myth that um, the people who were uh, here when, when the British settlers uh, came were not the Aborigines, not the original people. They were a violent people who entered and killed off all the original people uh, who may have come from Ireland. So that's one issue, you know, throughout the book, the self-indigenizing of, um, of people. So he builds on that as credibility that really, you know, we're not, we're really not immigrants. We're just returning to our former homeland. Um, so it's a kind of crazy book. And then he ends up, yeah, calling Native Americans uh, scattered tribes um, without governments and um, uh, that they uh, were immigrants. He calls them the, the first immigrants. So that was very interesting to me. Uh, so reading this book completely changed my, um, the trajectory of, um, how I was going to, you know, write the book and, and deal with it. it. It gave me so much more to work with and, and to clarify that this was something, and I know that period of time very well. It's when I was coming of age, um, uh, the 1950s, uh, post-World War II. And um, of course the sixties, you know, being involved in that, we dealt with racism, we dealt with, native, you know, red power, the land base, uh, all these things with feminism uh, that had not been dealt with before, but we really weren't dealing with, with um, settler colonialism. And of course I wasn't, even though I was my Dunbar and my family, my father's family were descendants of these Scots-Irish from Appalachia. They made the trek first to uh, out of Kentucky and then to Missouri and then to Oklahoma and many then scattered to the West, you know, with the Dust Bowl and so forth. So they're everywhere. Um, so I knew that history very well, but I thought it was normal. There were also immigrants around, Polish, uh, Czech and uh, German immigrants. There were also in Oklahoma, there were also um, Italian uh, and others, but in the central Oklahoma where I was, it was German Czech. And uh, in fact, there's a town that I grew up nine miles from this called the Czech capital of the world, Yukon, Oklahoma, uh, so predominantly Czech um, descendants. So I, I knew, I, I definitely had a concept of immigration. These were immigrants. Um, most of them were Catholic and I was a Southern Baptist uh, and Southern Baptist hated Catholics, uh, considered them um, evil, basically evil. <laughs> and um, yet, you know, my best friend was a Polish, Polish Catholic. And for, you know, my family was different. They, um, they got along fine, you know, with the uh, Catholic people. Of course we were odd in, in that my grandfather, my Dunbar grandfather had uh, been a socialist organizer right there in the county where I grew up. And most of the socialists that uh, started the socialist party, uh, not so much the leadership, but the actual on the ground organizers were, were German um, uh, immigrants and not, uh, you know, not, not Anglo or Scots. So, we were a little different than that. And that my father growing up like that just grew up without, well, my grandfather was also an atheist, you know, a non-believer um, and um, my father was too. So um, I, I feel privileged in that sense that I didn't become prejudiced um, 
uh, you know, anti-black racism is another thing, but I, I didn't think badly of, of immigrants, but I had no concept of settler colonialism. I just knew there was a difference between us that we were, you know, we were somewhat more authentic that there were, there were people to be treated with respect, but they weren't really, weren't really Americans. You know, that, that was a mental state. I've reviewed my thinking in my mind when I was younger, um, when I wrote a memoir called Red Dirt Growing Up Oki, trying to, you know, really be uh, clear about um, that. And that came in handy writing this book in, in terms of being able to read minds a little bit, you know, how settlers look at uh, they, the white nationalists are mostly descended from these original settlers. Um, and do not consider anyone who's ever come as an immigrant, you know, after the 1850s as uh, legitimately, whether they get citizenship or not, they're not, they're not fully Americans in their view. So that's the extreme view, but a lot of people don't understand that that's what uh, these armed um, white nationalists are about. Uh, they claim that uh, white genocide is taking place. And when they say white, they mean basically Anglo or Scots or German. Um, they don't really consider, uh, I mean, some people get through and get kind of honorary status, like the guy who founded the Proud Boys is actually a, a child of Cuban exiles. Uh, and he's very dark, but so it can, but they, they pass, but they're the minority because they have to agree with this assumption, you know, of the, of the, the superiority of the settler. Well, and I mean, like, you know, that's, that was one of the, you know, really deeply existential, you know, sort of experiences that I had reading your book, right? I mean, I've, I've talked about this a lot on my show, Working People, right, wherever talked a lot about my own family history and my own upbringing. But I mean, I, you know, as a first generation kind of Chicano growing up in Southern California, uh, I grew up very conservative, very Catholic. Right. And, and in Orange County, right. I had a lot of white friends. There, there was a, a lot of weird ways that that conservatism, the, the, the kind of want to be accepted and that sort of first generation aspect of our family it really created some interesting stuff there, right? Yeah, where where you, you you felt like, you know, we were doing it the right way, and the the immigrants, you know, or refugees who were crossing the border were doing it the wrong way, right? There, you mentioned mm -hmm. that word authenticity, right? There, I, I I hadn't put it in those terms, but I feel looking back, there was this sort of constant identity crisis that was circling the drain of authenticity a drain that was always empty at the center because I never knew what authentic, being an authentic American was, but I knew that it, it, whatever it was, I didn't have it within me. I had to perform it somehow. Right. Um, so, so there are a lot of, a lot of revelations that came, you know, for me personally, like reading your book, but um, you know, not just like personally, but, but really historically, as you just kind of walked us through, right. I, didn't quite realize that the nation of immigrants mythology that seemed to define so much of my family's history, so much of what I understood America to be was such a recent creation in our kind of like national right. discourse. And that I, that I kind of wanted to follow up on that because I think that by, by laying out that history, right, you know, you, you show to, to readers like myself that, um, you know, this was something that was created in a certain political context Obviously, you know, for someone like John F. Kennedy, as a, you know, Irish, you know, Catholic uh, aspirant to becoming president, there was a very clear, like, political motivation to reshaping that national mythology to m open up a path to building kind of like, you know, political coalition that could actually vote him into being president, right? So I, I wanted to ask how we got from there. To kind of like this, like you said, this this really targeted and under I guess understandable propaganda effort for someone like John F. Kennedy to run as president, be taken seriously, and ultimately be voted in. How and why we ended up seizing on that mythology and sort of 
you know, absorbing it into the larger political schema of the United States, this, this, this larger, you know, imperialist project, I guess, what was, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I really looked at that, um, that period a lot. It, um, uh, the 1950s, you know, the, the civil rights, I call it revolution, civil rights, the black civil rights revolution uh, that was, you know, really born in the South, uh, the former Confederacy, uh, was truly a revolution. And it, um, you know, and, uh, within a, a year of the founding of the United Nations, um, and, and, you know, and the first act of the United Nations was, a, it was the um, prohibition of genocide treaty, the UN treaty, um, Paul Robeson and um, other outstanding uh, W.B. Du Bois was still alive and was a part of this uh, saying, we charged genocide and took a manifesto uh, to the UN. Um, Native Americans have been, uh, had been had been expelled as such in 1953 with the, um, with the uh, Elimination of the actual Elimination Act, the um, uh, to lose all their their uh, status as Native people and land base, and it took twenty years of red power, you know, to reverse that, and a great deal was lost in the process. Um, but it could happen again, you know, just with the stroke of the pen, because under a colonial system of uh, trust trusteeship, they don't actually own their communal lands. Um, so that's, you know, colonialism still, uh, still existed. So here's the competition that came out of World War II with communism. Uh, China uh, became communist in, in uh, 1949. And of course, the Bolshevik revolution was already uh, 40 years old and um, clearly seemed like it was here to stay <laughs> um, at the time, but the U.S. did everything it could to destroy it and, and that was uh, successful in doing so. Uh, but this presented a huge challenge and especially with TV, um, TV coming into play, uh, pictures of um, you know video uh, actual film footage of uh, of cops uh, bloodying uh, unarmed uh, protesters in the South, like white cops, and these images that were going over the the Soviets were using this as propaganda. Um, I mean, it was truth. <laughs> it really was propaganda. Used to and as you know, in Spanish meant truth. Um, but it, um, it was, uh, shameful, you know, and they, of course they set up, uh, they set up, uh, Air America to publicize everything they were doing. That was so good. And also they, they were rushing to create, cover up the history of slavery, the history of genocide, all of these things, which the rest of the world didn't know about. Um, and largely still don't because U.S. propaganda is everywhere. And, you know, the official story is, is never breached at any governmental level until, well, until Black and Native people uh, uh, and also Chicanos, you know, farm workers started going to the United Nations in the 19, well, you know, uh, Black people actually in the 1950s and the uh, I started working with the International Indian Treaty Council in 74, and we went to the UN in 77. So this was, you know, really late, but it was such a shock to people from all over the world, including, you know, very socialist, uh, still socialist governments in, um, uh, and national liberation movements in the 1970s, that they had no idea. You know, they knew there had been Indians. They were all wiped out, and there weren't very many of them. And um, you know that that the U.S. was a great democracy, and um, and that 
you know, they certainly learned differently quickly with Angola and the counter revolutions, the counter insurgencies that the, that, uh, the US did in Africa. Um, and of course, it's everywhere in the Caribbean, overthrowing coups. And so people learned that they were imperialists and learned it, that, but they didn't really know the history of settler colonialism. They still thought it was a, a democracy that was not, um, was going off the track. And um, that's what the U.S. wanted to present is, is to cover up that history. So I think the nation of immigrants, beside the reason it got picked up, and there's a reason why John F. Kennedy wrote it. I'm sure he wasn't thinking all those things because he didn't know it himself. Uh, he was thinking of getting elected. But um, why it was picked up by U.S. historians who are, you know, really um, people who, who are U.S. citizens who do um, U, U.S. history, uh, you know, U.S. historians who do, who have U.S. citizenship, who do European history or Asian history, they usually do a very good job, even they're pretty good even on Latin American history um, these days or in the last 30 years or so. Uh, but if they do U.S. history to fit into that and to prosper, to get tenure, you know, to get high level jobs, uh, to publish books, they really have to stay within the mythology, you know, the, the origin story. But they had to change that origin story when they're up against an adversary that actually has studied the United States and knows, um, you know, knows these things. I mean, just they, all they have to do is show the film footage uh, when I was in Cuba on the Vince Ramos Brigade in 1970, they showed us some of the black and white uh, footage that aired in Cuba in uh, the early 1960s. And um, they were awful. We, I, uh, you know, I, I had watched a lot of these horrible things. It really politicized me seeing uh, the treatment of people. You know, that's one, really how I got politicized was opposing the, um, uh, you know, this violence uh, against black people that was becoming obvious. And of course the wonderful uh, mass movements. Um, so they were seeing this and they showed it to us. And I, I remembered some of it that I had actually seen myself, but it was very raw. At that time, TV, they didn't have very much programming. So they were just filming everything and putting it all up. You know, that changed. It became very manicured and programmed and everything. But it's one, one way the Vietnam War was um, exposed, was really the press. They, they just were filming it, you know. Uh, Dan Rather, you know, watching them with the uh, Zippo lighter. Uh, um, uh, setting fire to a, a hut uh, of a Vietnamese peasant. It was all filmed, you know, so there was that window and, uh, you know, controlling that. And I think, you know, creating multiculturalism uh, in education was the liberal solution because liberals and conservatives had their differences about domestic politics, but to this day, when it comes to war and, um, foreign policy, they have very few differences. Uh, you notice uh, with the announcement of uh, Biden that he's going to uh, go ahead and uh, stay in Mexico, uh, Trump's policies, and he already had several others that he, he has simply uh, reenacted. But that's, the, it's always, the border's always the same, what, Republican or Democrat, Whatever they say, they're all doing the same thing. Exclusion, deportation, uh, detention. Um, so that, that never changes. So this was a very bipartisan thing uh, at first, you know, creating this new mythology. And um, one of the things that really spurred me to um, write the book was this 19, uh, 2015 
uh, blockbuster Hamilton, uh, the musical, Alexander Hamilton, the musical, then um, um, uh, Manuel Miranda's um, blockbuster, that's still, uh, it's six years now, and it still sells out every performance. It was made into a major motion picture. And um, it is the reenactment of a nation of immigrants. Uh, it, it, it stunned me. I could tell from just, you know, how people were reacting to it. It was like liberals. Now, this is where liberals and conservatives kind of separated on this because uh, it's so, you know, verbally anti-immigrant, especially anti uh, uh, the border. Um, so the nation of immigrants was, you know, really a, a liberals carried it through and including multiculturalism, because you probably remember in the 90s, the, the um, textbook wars uh, and keeping multiculturalism out. Um, there were the books, the textbooks that were coming out had the first chapter, just like Kennedy of of Native Americans as the first immigrants. It was always it's the first chapter. Of course, they had left out Native Americans it, it, completely before that, uh, but they made them the first immigrants. And and um, the the whole multicultural thing was um, uh, it became a. That's when white nationalism really became you know. A, a, uh, at the at the top levels of uh, government, uh, with you know the Gingrich and those other really strange uh, people in the legislature in the 1990s, um, but it really started in the 1950s with the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, 1953 of school desegregation. Up to that time. Everything was white and, and mostly Anglo. The um, entire government, uh, you know, the tiny exceptions, uh, one or two uh, state governments, uh, state legislatures, Congress, uh, down to school boards, uh, police forces, everything was run uh, at the highest levels and even pretty far down by white. Anglo-Saxon Protestants <laughs> still, and um, the uh, um, Jim Crow was fully intact at the end of World War II, and of course there were um, people who had been fighting it. Uh, w. B. Du Bois founded in AACP and in, in uh, nineteen hundred and one. You know, so it was already. Uh, 50, 50 years old by mid-century. And, um, but it was, you know, the work of, um, of uh, intellectuals like that and lawyers that they brought that case, that desegregation case and they won. And this was very clearly the um, Supreme Court has always been political, it's never been, but it goes with you know what um, what the system needs in order to uh, reflect you know to to uh, keep everything intact to keep the the structures of uh, racial capitalism going and uh, intact while doing whatever has to be done for show you know to uh, not be condemned for it. But you had this, this, this backlash, uh, not only the violence you know, that we saw on the ground, but the formation of the John Birch Society, a self-identified white nationalist organization, um, the um, citizens councils that formed almost in every state. Uh, when I first took stand, I, you know, I was only, um, I, w I moved to the city my last year of high school, and that's where I saw civil rights demonstrations, uh, young people doing sit-ins at the big, uh, big flashy drugstore, Katz drugstore downtown. And my uh, Central High, the trade school I went to was downtown. So I would actually you know, walk by, I, I didn't join, I didn't think I could, I didn't have any idea 
but I really admired them. And of course they were on the news and everything. So this was uh, like 1955. And um, that I don't think I even knew until then about the, the desegregation decision, you know, growing up in rural Oklahoma, you don't really get that level of news you know, of, of something like that, but um, a lot of censorship of the press in Oklahoma, oil and gas, uh, you know, it's really almost like, it was almost like a, a Batista or Samosa kind of regime in Oklahoma. Um, everything having to do with communists was banned. The commun uh, if, if Marx's capital was found even in someone's home in their private library, they could be arrested. And those laws were all in place while I was growing up. So they, you know, after the red success in Oklahoma in the early part of the 20th century, they really took over, drove everyone out. Um, and um, uh, clamp down, you know, really hard. So it's pretty much still like that today. Um, so growing up there, it was spotty, you know, the, and I wanted to get out, just get out of there, which I got married and we did come to San Francisco to find, you know, people we could, um, really, you know, do something without getting, getting hurt or killed or banned or whatever. Um, so that was, you know, probably a cowardly thing to do. <laughs> it was, it was impossible to, to function in the fifties there. So that was, you know, that was going on, uh, that white nationalism of the John Birch Society spawned other organizations. Soon you had the second amendment foundation by, Har um, which was Harlan Carter's outfit, um, and you probably found this part um, very interesting. I don't know if you knew about it, that he had been a border guard. His father was a border guard, a board, and he was the border chief of Operation Webback in the 1950s, the rounding up and deportation of, um, of Mexicans. Some of them, quite a few of them, actually citizens. Uh, they just rounded up every Mexican. It was all... It's pretty much all for show that they were doing something, you know, to uh, limit the, while, you know, the growers all were recruiting undocumented uh, Mexicans to do the agricultural work. So it was, uh, you know, it was a show, but nevertheless, he was, he was in charge of it and pretty well known. But when he um, retired from the uh, border, uh, as a border chief, he had already been a member of the National Rifle Association, but he started this organization in the white nationalist enclave of Eastern Washington state and called the Second Amendment Foundation. The Second Amendment was never ever an issue. And he, um, uh, they then set out and it took four years, they took over the National Rifle Association. So that's when the National Rifle Association became a, um, white nationalist organization. So that, you know, I, I have, you know, Harlan Carter's horrible deed. He was, a, he was a real monster as a, you know, as a border guard. He also killed a, a Mexican boy um, that was actually in, in El Paso uh, in the same, you know, in the town, same town. And um, uh, when, he was, when he was 15, uh, he shot and killed this Mexican boy. He was tried and did some prison, but it was overthrown and wiped off his record. So he, he became a border chief. So that sort of gives you an idea of who, who works the border. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I did not know that detail until I read it in your book. And I was like, oh. That makes sense. <laughs> that, that tracks. <laughs> right? um, and, you know, I mean, um, so this, this is what I mean when I say like there are just so many rich and, and important and interesting details in the book that really help, you know, me and, and others as readers, I think, again, see um, how these sorts of truths that we grew up with about what America is, who it is and 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 what like the goal of the american project is supposed to be we start to see how um 
artificially constructed those have been, um, the motivations for kind of pushing this or that type of mythology. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to kind of fold that into a question about how your analysis, you know, really does lay bare, again, like what, like, you know, like when you, it's kind of like, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So that's kind of what you're doing with America. You're like, okay, America says it's this, but here's, I'm going to look at the machine and basically tell you what the function is. And you kind of really land on this, this, um, you know, analysis of the United States as a perpetual settler colonialist project that coheres into what um, you refer to as the fiscal military state, right? So not, you know, this sort of beacon of democracy, right? But but actually a sort of engine designed to do a very specific thing, you know, in its territory here in the United States and, and then increasingly around the world. And so I wanted to ask about that, but I guess one thing I wanted to mention is like, I think one thing that was really revealing in your book was sort of the existential and cultural function that the nation of immigrants mythology serves. It was even kind of in, in, implicit in a lot of what you were saying, right? I think about the, you know, the, the Americana and all the kind of culture that I grew up with that defined America for me. I think about lines like in uh, you are my, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you know, you make me happy when skies are gray. And then it ends with like, please don't take my sunshine away. There's this, this almost deep sort of felt fear in, wow. you know, the American soul that recognizes somewhere like the original crime of indigenous, gen of like coming to a continent, genociding an entire population, it, it, it trying as much as possible to erase their very presence and then trying retroactively to rewrite the history of how they got there and how you got there, there's almost this perpetual need for absolution that, that Americans have to forgive themselves for that original sin that will never go away. And it feels like the nation of immigrants was the kind of one of the perfect ways that we landed on to, to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was, uh, you know, at the, at the higher levels that it was thought out, you know, definitely as propaganda uh, in competition with uh, communism, which was offering, you know, equality and, and food and housing and all public goods, public ownership of things and, you know, things that uh, people really want <laughs> and, um, and long for, but, but you don't enunciate, you know, the, the cult of individualism and making it on your own in the United States is, uh, it makes it seem actually unpatriotic. Uh, I mean, that, that's actually how, how it's, uh, uh, how it's framed as unpatriotic to, to want those things. So people have this gnawing hunger, this gnawing guilt. I think it's a very, you know, mentally ill country. Um, and I, I say that, you know, uh, uh, I do psychoanalysis and um, I, I mean, I have a psychoanalyst. I, I, don't do, I don't do it myself. I receive it. And she actually um, confirms that that there is, you know, that this this she 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 says I've made her see it, you know, that she didn't really really get it, you know, get get how deep and why so many people turn up so with such problems, you know, and um, and fears, and I think this. Of course, for immigrants and the children of immigrants, there's a constant fear of, of being contingent, you know, of not, um, I think that word, which I, I hardly ever saw in literature until I started reading memoirs by um, more recent immigrants, mostly from Africa and South Asia, uh, and their feelings of contingency um, that just never goes away, even, you know, when they're third or fourth generation, it still hangs on, um, that that's their, but, you know, with multiculturalism, I remember people suddenly, uh, it was very interesting that uh, everyone was working so hard to become white, you know, Noel Ignatius' wonderful book on how the Irish became white. Of course, they were already white, but they were considered the other, you know, and of course, Catholic. 
but they became the police, you know, they became um, uh, slave, worked in slave patrols and anti-black racism is always a, a, a tool of, of proving your, your affinity with whiteness. And so these things get picked up as, as survival mechanisms by immigrants. I don't think it's some, you know, evil thing in them, you know, that, that to survive in the United States, uh, you have to have some level of whiteness, uh, uh, you know, culturally, and even if you can't achieve it physically, uh, <laughs> that, that you can become an honorary, kind of an honorary white person. And I think that uh, immigrants uh, are put on that path of aspiring to that. And that creates huge um, problems, you know, intergenerational, you know, losing the language. I, when I moved to San Francisco and uh, into um, very near Chinatown, what we call Chinatown, and mostly had Chinese neighbors, I would um, hear the elder, a lot of elder, a lot of generations and elderly people speaking. And I really loved the sound of the language I was hearing. It was, I found out mostly Cantonese. And then, then at San Francisco State, my fellow, some Chinese students, uh, they didn't speak the language. And I would ask why, it's, it sounds so beautiful. And they said, well, no, they, you know, it keeps, it holds us back, you know. So, and I think that I heard that from Chicanos too, that their, you know, their families uh, who they were mostly, when I was at UCLA, mostly, uh, by then first and second generation uh, from Mexico and they too, their families. Um, so they, they spoke this Spanglish, you know, uh, a mixed kind of Chicano language and um, which people started writing poetry. And I mean, it's kind of a, a dialect in itself, but that deprivation of a, a, of a mother tongue just seems quite, really cruel you know it's so hard to learn a language a second language when you're an adult um and to just have it as a gift because it's you know you can speak uh dozens of languages it doesn't take away from any one of them and so that really struck me i i didn't know that because i hadn't been around that many people i knew the german you know the those immigrants they didn't speak their languages uh, the people my age, but I made nothing of it. Uh, but, you know, seeing uh, people who were so different um, as the Chinese people and hearing their language and, and really liking, you know, the feel of their families and their extended families and their, of course, their food <laughs> and um, Chinese New Year and everything. I was just fascinated. And there was this kind of shame you know, and, uh, and the people my age uh, really, and I, I didn't understand it, you know, at the time, but I think that's so tragic. It's uh, generations and generations of uh, people who have suffered, uh, you know, trying to become accepted and Americanized. And I have to tell them, it's never going to work. You have to change this country. <laughs> You know, and you can't do it by numbers. Uh, it's uh, structural. You know, that's that's what uh, critical race theory is, and why they're so afraid of it. Um, the right wing, because it says that this is built into every structure that exists in the United States, and that it, you know it's not going to go away with. Um, with uh, training, diversity training, <laughs> it's, you can be become the nicest person in the world and, and spew about your anti-racism and read every book. And it's not going to change anything, probably not even you, because so much of it is automatic and not something you really have control over unless you're, you're almost re-educated, you know. But ethnic studies has gone a long ways. I think that's one of the things I worked on that we brought out of the 60s was ethnic studies. I think it has, I noticed, you know, until the pandemic, I was traveling a lot and speaking to mostly at universities, uh, undergraduate students and uh, the diversity impressed me so much, but how, 
how loving they were with each other, how, uh, you know, that word woke, <laughs> uh, I like that word myself, how woke they were to everything. Uh, they didn't know us, they don't know as much about Native people, but they just immediately grasp it and, uh, you know, and, and that, so there is something else going on. Um, we'll get to that later, you know, what we can think about for the future, but, um, but it is, you know, it's a, it's a horrible, uh, horrible kind of uh, processing that um, how Columbus was used and is still a problem, you know, as a cult figure uh, to, to Americanize the Italians, you know, of posing him as the first founder, that they're actually descended from Columbus and he was Italian and Catholic. So therefore they are original people, you know, this, they have to find a way to make themselves, and it worked, you know, it, it pretty much worked. I mean, most Italian people now are, you know, third or fourth generation. Um, identify as white and uh, um, and there's some real monsters like Pompeo and Giuliani and, and all that made it, you know, made it to the top. And um, uh, I know Cuomo, you know, try, there was the idea of presidency that they haven't done so well. I mean, there's still, a, a you know, a, really a scrutiny uh, that goes on that, that, um, uh even generations on you know so it's a it's it's something that that uh, but i do think the center of it and of course james baldwin was very um important to my understanding uh this at the at a really deep level i started reading james baldwin when i was in high school his early work uh, and his novels and um I, but I've learned much more, you know, and uh, even even very recently with um, Raoul Peck's uh, uh, film on uh, I Am Not Your Negro, um, a part, uh, unpublished uh, things he wrote, but that, that um, this is a, um, uh, this is a, a structural thing that immigrants, he talked a lot about immigrants. Um, when I was re-researching, I hadn't really noticed, you know, his emphasis on immigrants. He was really trying to talk to immigrants and have them not be complicit in anti-Black racism. Um, and so that, you know, um, it's really hard. I mean, I think it's hard for people to, they look, especially, it's not them so much as their children. They want them to be able to adjust and do well in school and go to college and be able to do a good job and not become a, um, a radical, you know, and get themselves in trouble. And it's understandable human passions that it's so cruel in the United States that um, this is fed anti-Black ra racism and hatred and hatred for people at the border um, hardly any objection to the treatment of the Haitians, who I just learned are all in a horrible detention camp uh, in the desert in New Mexico. Um, and no one, you know, even knows they're there, their families or anyone. They don't even know why they're there. So it's, you know, this, this cruelty that goes on that, that, that is that we um, tolerate, you know, it's largely tolerated that uh, they should get in the legal way you know all right i mean you know I, like uh i was saying earlier you know i i recognize that um and and identify with that i i can look back at my own history and and see a lot of myself in in what you were just saying right i i know that there were plenty of times where you know you you're you're if you're a teenager, you want to be popular, right? You want to be accepted, right? You, you, you know, you want the cool kids to think that you're one of them. And when those cool kids are white, um, you know, one of the ways that you can do that as a Brown person is to be self-deprecating, right? Play into the, the kind of jokes about Mexicans like I did, but also you can, you're very much encouraged, right? To participate in that sort of 
culture of punching sideways and punching downwards, right? So you make fun of, you know, the the black students, the East Asian students, right? It's kind of like we're we're all you know, throwing barbs at each other for, you know, our white friends amusement and it, and you gain a sort of purchase on whiteness through that, right. You gain that sort of acceptance. Um, and, and even if you don't realize that that's what you're doing and it took a lot of time, I think for me to sort of gradually decouple myself from that, that kind of culture and, and all that good stuff. But I definitely recognize it in what you're saying and, and can think back to how it, it shaped who I was, uh, earlier in my life, but like like you were saying, from from Baldwin to you know, kind of very, the very beginnings of of where we started with this talk, I think that what you do show so you know beautifully in this book is that understanding that this is baked into the structure of what America is, right, and what America as a government. And in the government's relationship to, um, you know, the land, to its people, to the economy, what it was designed to do. Right? And, um, you know, I could, I could talk to you about this all day, but I don't want to take liberties with your time. So I was, I was thinking about folding this in, right, since right now everyone is still talking about critical race theory and, and rejecting that sort of structural analysis that sees what you lay out in this book that, settler colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, like that these are part of how the, the America has grown into what it is. This is part of how the structures that govern our lives were fashioned in the first place and by whom they were fashioned and upon whose graves they were fashioned, right? So that's that's like where I found the concept of seeing America as this fiscal military state was really enlightening for me, right? It, it it tore away the, again, the mythology and helped me sort of see what this machine that we call the United States of America was really built to do and how effectively it does that. I wanted to ask if you could, if you could talk a little bit about what that concept, you know, does for your book, why it's, uh, it's so important for understanding, you know, the United States. And then, you know, we can kind of, um, wrap up and, and think about like how what we've learned over the past centuries of how to combat that um, and what we and how we can do that, you know, in the 21st century. Yeah, I, I was so happy to um, find that concept. Um, there's a wonderful uh, law review article. It's 95 pages long, um, but it's uh, free. Uh, on the internet. It's called The Savage Constitution uh, by, <clears throat> by a um, now Stanford law professor, Greg uh, Abrowski. And he uses that term. He studies the Constitution. It's, it's interesting. I, had, I see, you know, in my indigenous people's history of the United States, and even before that, I I have de I've tried to deal with the cult of the Constitution. I've seen it as dating, you know, to the Puritans and having to write everything down, and the, you know the uh, uh, and the Pilgrims, and you know this kind of Protestant, uh, this Calvinist Calvinism, um, because that's what I was, you know, taught uh, in or learned from from or gleaned <laughs> from uh, from history. But it, it's so ephemeral, you know, I am a, a historical materialist and I want to get something, you know, a little bit clearer about this. And though those roots may be so, it's in the writing of the Constitution uh, that, that before they wrote the Constitution, they wrote the Northwest Ordinance and published it. It was the Continental Congress that produced it, the Founding Fathers produced the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance is the essence of the Constitution. It was folded in, you know, when the Constitution was written, it was actually passed by the Congress, you know, as, um, as, as the structure. So people, I, I know US historians avoid it. There's a wonderful younger, um, I mean, he's not young, young, he's younger than me, um, historian at the University of Oregon, Jeffrey Osler, who is, 
written a book last year, published a book. He had already published a couple of articles uh, that really are good. Um, I The book came out after, you know, after my book had already gone to pr production. So I, I cite it, but I, I wasn't able to use it. But Abraski, I already had this down from um, this fiscal military state. It means uh, it's a, it's a um, technical term. Uh, it's, it was used by British historians to describe you know, the British empire, uh, you know, its whole mechanism. And it, it, it translates into, out of the legalese, it translates into a state made for war. So it's a, um, in the case of the United States, it's a capitalist state made for war. It's structured as a capitalist state. You know, the, of course, Alexander Hamilton was the key person in this, the bank, you know, the banking. He was one of the few people who had, had a knowledge of economics because his, um, his benefactor in the Caribbean had trained him in accounting. Of course, the accounting was accounting of the slave trade, you know, the <laughs> counting the commodities of bodies. Um, but he had had it down and he was very key to that. Some of the others were a little more ideal. Also, you know, looking at the Roman empire and Greeks and he was, you know, he had it down um, what, what this should be. And it made sense to all of them because what they had in mind that's clear in the Northwest ordinance with the maps is the conquest of the continent. They had maps drawing um, you know, they, they, it was, you know, not exactly as accurate as surveying later, but the continental for, uh, uh, outline to get to the Pacific, to get to um, dominating the trade with China, because China was the largest trading, uh, you know, had more commodities to train, trade, trade than any other uh other country or monarchy in the world. Um, so the China trade that started in the medieval age, you know, Europeans wanting to control Chinese China. And um, so they inherited this. This is like a, a part of their DNA as, um, as Brits. And so they, that was their concept of, of conquering the continent. And, um, that was completed uh, pretty much. I mean, the wars weren't over. They went on to eight, in the 1890s of the resistance of, of native people in all those areas. But with the um, uh, annexing, you know, through uh, a two year horrible, violent, uh, deadly counterinsurgent war invasion occupation of Mexico, um, they took ha the northern half of Mexico. So that got them to the Pacific. That was California was their, their goal, but they took the, of course, took the whole thing. Uh, they, and so that, um, that didn't take very long. You know, after the writing of the constitution, it was, a, it was very clear and the Northwest Ordinance had the map. So they immediately, immediately started surveying uh, in the Ohio territory, which the British had, uh, the British uh, proclamation of, uh, of 1763 after uh, the French and Indian War forbade any uh, British settlers to go over the proclamation line that is into the Appalachians or over it, into the Ohio Valley, the Ohio you know, the, the, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf uh, was at that time called the Ohio Valley, the Northwest Territory. They weren't talking about Washington, Oregon, they're talking about Ohio Territory uh, in the Northwest, uh, uh, that was the Northwest at the time. So that, um, they, uh, they started immediately and very, very scientifically surveying and already George Washington had um, had take, been taking survey teams into that area, um, starting in in the um, 1720s. Um, that that's how he made his fortune was 
was mapping and then making deeds of sale of which he didn't own and the British, you know, it was, was British claimed territory, but there were no British settlers there. There were no British traders. Um, there were still, you know, very large numbers of uh, native villages. And there were, of course, uh, farmers uh, had, had uh, corn, beans and squash and, um, were you know not uh, they they did get involved in the fur trade with the French, but and it changed you know if you look at Native American history, it made changes in them, but it was not occupied. It was not settler colonialism, and uh, so they couldn't go in there. And those who went in had gone in illegally, uh, like George Washington buying these. He had sold these deeds. That's how he became a multimillionaire was selling fake deeds uh, to settlers um, that thought they could go claim that land. So there was a huge investment by the founding fathers. They were all involved in um, one way or another in land speculation, but he was the top one. You know, uh, George Washington was known as the surveyor. I actually, as a, a child learning this in the third or fourth grade, I found, because then there were pictures of him, you know, all dressed, looking like a really rich person, you know, with braids and, and boots and, and the hair, you know, some kind of hair piece. And he looked like a, a monarch. And um, I had a cousin who's a surveyor and he was always muddy, you know, with boots on and tromping around. It wasn't exactly a, you know, a prestigious job. And I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't figure that out. George Washington is a surveyor and he, he dresses like that. You know, how does he keep so clean? You know, of course, he was only leading uh, his militia of surveyors. He wasn't actually doing the work. And I, you know, took me a long time to figure that out. But um, it was, he was known as the surveyor. So they had a vested interest in breaking with Britain because they all had, you know, had financial interests. Not only that, but uh, of course, uh, the continuation of chattel slavery and the expansion of it, because already, you know, the southern colonies were mo uh, moving, you know, moving into the large, you know, what became the Cotton Kingdom, the richest, one of the richest. Um, agricultural areas of the one of the seven great agricultural areas of the world that Native Americans created. Uh, and they had come from Mesoamerica and had done the same thing as had happened in Mesoamerica. And this was, um, they had their eyes on that for expansion of uh, plantation, you know, cotton uh, as a commodity. So that, um, you know, capitalism was, there are all these books out now um, making clear that, that uh, the Cotton Kingdom was the platform for the formation of, uh, of um, not pre-capitalism, but capitalism, that it was not a uh, medieval, you know, uh, a return to a medieval practice like Eugene Genovese tried to make it. It was actually um, the fount of capitalism. Um, just, just the value of those human bodies, enslaved bodies, were greater than all other assets of the United States put together at that time. So this is the fiscal military state. It's, um, it, you have to deal both with slavery and you have to deal with uh, uh, settler colonial. They had to create settler colonialism to occupy um, the country because these were, you know, native people were not, you know, just wandering tribes. They had governments, they had, they quickly formed armies. They hadn't, you know, the farmers anyway, east of the Mississippi are all farmers. And in the Southwest, they, they didn't, uh, you know, really have to have armies or anything. The farmers don't like war. Um, but as, you know, as these adversaries came in and tried to take their land, they began building um, military confederations like Tecumseh's and so forth. And, and so it, 
it took them a hundred years, uh, a little more than a hundred years from the Northwest Ordinance and the Constitution uh, to fully control the continent. It's a hundred years of war unending uh, daily, every minute. I don't think there's a minute in US history that anyone can find actually dating back to the uh, first colony and the founding of the US to the present that the United States is not making war somewhere, including at this time, not declared war, but wars at this time, they're still fighting the Moros in the Philippines. They're still, you know, uh, and all over in Africa uh, involved. They have military, they still have military in Iraq and they have uh, mercenaries in, in Afghanistan. So they're not, you know, there's always, they can't do without war. Um, that that is, you know, it's built in, and it's the only thing that usually unites. It's been problematic since the '60s, and you know, and the anti-imperialism of the '60s, the anti-Vietnam War, um, which didn't really turn into a, a true anti-imperialist movement. You know, Will, William Appleman uh, Williams, the great. Um, so-called diplomatic historian, but he was the historian of U.S. imperialism. Um, he, he his wonderful book, uh, "Imperialism as a Way of Life," his 1980 book is a, a must read. He he lists all of the interventions, thousands of them, uh, actually during the uh, right after you know at at the time of of independence, the U.S. had by 1810, they had warships all over the world in every dock, you know, um, opening so-called free trade. They had two wars against uh, Muslims in, the, um, uh, in uh, Tripoli. Um, so they were, they were, this was in 1806 and 1808 under Jefferson, two two wars that are never taught about, the bar so-called Barbary Wars. This is where the Marines get their song from the halls of Montezuma. They wrote it after, you know, taking Mexico City. They wrote it there and it's from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And why there's no curiosity, what, what's Tripoli doing in there, you know? I, I mean, it's just, it, 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 it is, you know, this fiscal military state from the very beginning and from the beginning of U.S. Uh, of Mexico's independence, actually before that, it was very clear the writing was on the wall, you know, because the war went on for 10 years, um, the war against Spain in Mexico. And it was pretty devastated at, at that end, but, you know, here was so from 1821, they started moving into Mexico. They call it Texas, but it was Mexico you know, that the slave owners were moving into and then claiming as their own. And most people think that, you know, Texas really did become independent in the state of the United States, but that was not in any way legal in, in quotation marks until the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Texas was included. And so even that history that should be so clear is, is muddied, you know, with the uh, obfuscations of, uh, of the reality. So I think the fiscal military uh, uh, concept and then understanding you have to take a, a magnifying glass to the constitution after you know, read the Northwest Ordinance and see what they're writing into it in a kind of legalistic language. And then you, you break it down. And I'm still trying to do that work that Savage Constitution does it. And he's written more, Brasky's written even more articles uh, since then. Um, he also works very closely with, uh, you know, native land rights uh, um, that he is very clear that the taking of the continent meant taking of land and that land was for agribusiness um, and uh, cash crops, uh, commodities, not, you know, yeoman farmers, yeah, this idea of uh, uh, the yeoman farmer that uh, Jefferson considered himself with his 300 slaves. Right. 
Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's such an important kind of way to look at, again, the, the American project, the American machine, how it's been constructed and what it's been constructed to do. And as you just said, right, you, then you start to see how, whether we're talking about the nation of immigrants, whether we're talking about the sort of constructed, you know, fabulous mythology of Christopher Columbus as the first, you know, American as a way for Italian Americans to gain a purchase on like their right to, you know, be American citizens and be accepted into that white dominant culture, yada, yada, yada. You start to see how that mythology, as you just said, works to obfuscate the nature of the beast we're living in. Um, and, and I think that that is one of the really unsettling, um, but I think generative like points that I, that I took away from your book was I started to think is like, wow, even the, the, the concept of America as a nation of immigrants, we've already seen in, in my lifetime, how the fiscal military state has used that when it is useful to it and discards it when it no longer needs it. So that, you know, you got Trump, you know, as a perfect example. But then, as you mentioned, this is very much bipartisan. Uh, you know, Kamala Harris is over there in Central America telling everyone don't come to the United States. The supposed nation of immigrants is you know, like, <laughs> telling people to get the hell out. Um, so it's like that mythology when it when it works to. Yeah, like uh, counteract the, the Soviet Union exposing the racial crimes of the United States. And it can be folded into the body of the fiscal military state to serve those ends. It will do so. But when we enter kind of a 21st century where the, the needs of that fiscal military state are perhaps different, um, you know, it, it, it was kind of uh, I almost had whiplash with how quickly we as a culture dropped that mythology and started kind of reverting back to this sort of like, who gets to be here? Who's the original, who's the authentic kind of Americans who doesn't appreciate being here enough. And I think that's, that's kind of where I wanted to um, end up. Cause I could genuinely talk to you about this all day, but I don't want to keep you uh, any longer than I have to. So I think by way of rounding out, right. I, I guess I, I, you know, my climate anxiety is through the roof most days. Right. Me too. Right. And I mean, and, and, you know, we've already seen, we're already living in the kind of, you know, dystopian hell that we have to look forward to for the rest of the century. And we know what's going to come with it, right? As the climate crisis gets worse, caused by the machinations of, you know, capitalism and, and its dominant powers like the United States and the industries that it serves, yada, yada, yada. As all of that comes to a boiling point, ruins the shared planet that that we all live on creates mass famine you know mass you know like a uh, 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 weather events that create climate refugees the harried race for resources becomes ever more intense between national powers and the impulse i think with trump we basically got a, a preview of what we have in store for the rest of the century where the impulse is going to be hoard as many resources as we can in the global north, put the walls up even higher, like, you know, it, th this paradigm of gatedness, like that we are on the sort of gated island, the barbarians are at the gates, we don't care how they got here, we don't care if we caused, like, their displacement, we have to hold on to what is ours, please don't take my sunshine away, comes back and haunts, you know, like uh, the American project. And I guess I just am... am very worried, right, about, you know, like how that, you know, that sort of political paradigm that easily gives way to eco-fascism, you know, how, how, how quick people are to sort of take that up and, and how quick people are to want to be on that life raft, right, to not to want to kick others off so that we can all stay on it. Like that is where we are going to be encouraged to go every day for the rest of our lives and I guess I just uh, kind of wanted to ask, like, building on the, the everything that you write in your book, building on all that you yourself have learned through, through years and decades of research and activism and meeting so many people who are on the ground fighting the good fight, even when times seem to be their darkest, 
how do we how do we kind of like you know forge ahead into this very kind of uh uh scary future and fight for you know fight for a way of being in on this planet being together that that doesn't kind of replay the crimes of of the fiscal military state of the of that that we've been living in that how do we get out of this how do we fight this i guess is my last question to you roxanne dunbar or t <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, it was it was very discouraging um, writing this book during. You know, I finally had time. Everything was canceled, all travel canceled, and all last year, so I could no longer um, avoid sitting down and actually writing the book. But writing it um, during that time and witnessing, uh, you know, and I have very compromised. Um, respiratory system, being a, a, a lifelong asthmatic. I was born with asthma and um, just, you know, just wishing if people just wear your mask. You know, I, I couldn't go outside. People weren't, and this is San Francisco. They weren't wearing their masks. Um, they weren't, uh, you know, people. And then when the vaccines came, um, we have, you know, we, we don't, nowhere near herd immunity. We have 66% uh, of, of people um, fully vaccinated in, in the country and it needs to be 85 or 90 to really have herd immunity. So I, the individualism, you know, the, the, the hoarding that took place early on, you know, those scenes of <laughs> buying toilet paper, we, we still haven't figured out the psychology of that, but um, uh, I found myself thinking, wow, maybe I need a lot of toilet paper for some reason. I mean, it, it is kind of addictive, you know, it's like, um, it's, it's like uh, the individualism, you know, that unless you're in community, which I, I, I fortunately am, or close extended family, um, you really are on your own, and and that's most people in, in the country. Something like uh, I live alone, you know, and actually something like fifty five percent of the population lives a uh, single, uh, is a single person uh, alone, and um, that you know there may be children, but but uh, not old enough to help out <laughs> that much. So it it's it's really it was really. Um, discouraging and then encouraging seeing the Black Lives Matter um, protests and people responding uh, with, a, and, and the way they carried it out being very careful um, in terms of the, of the pandemic, uh, we're all wearing masks and all distancing, you know, and there was, there was no um, super spreading in those demonstrations. Uh, and I never felt, you know, comfortable myself joining in just because of my own status, but health status. But I did pay attention to that because I was worried about, you know, about a lot of the young people I know. Um, but it was discouraging. And then, then, you know, with Glasgow coming up uh, and people preparing for the um, all last year, trying to prepare for, uh, you know, some some really uh, ramped up uh, policies that, that could uh, at least try to halt. I mean, we've already had so much destruction and some of it's not reversible and it's coming so fa much faster than predicted. And um, to find, you know, the United States being um, uh, refusing to sign the, the zero carbon goal um, because I guess of Joe Manchin, uh, they changed their mind, you know, because Joe Manchin uh, objected being, you know, owner of coal mines. And so capitalism is killing us. You know, I think that's the message we have to get out. And I also think that for the left, you know, there's a problem because um, I've also experienced and studied the left, including, you know, my idealized uh, grandfather and the early socialist movement, which I admire so much. And that's before I, I knew that 
Chinese were excluded and black people were excluded, you know, it was white. <laughs> and um, uh, that, that the, the left in, in, in the United States has um, developed really by immigrants in the industrial period of the 1880s and 1890s. These are uh, largely uh, immigrant populations who were working as most of the Anglo Scots people, um, you know, with the exception of say the Appalachian coal miners, um, the, and, and there, there were of course a lot of Irish and Italian immigrants as well. So these were, you know, these were uh, the goal of workers was not to really form a working class revolution, but to buy, be able to buy property, you know, and to become middle class. And that's what they did, you know, by the 1950s, the, the government sponsored the GI housing and, you know, housing for white people and the suburbs uh, popped up and everything. So really we've never had an authentic um, working class movement, I think in the United States, uh, because the goal of any of, of settlers and then immigrants I have to pick this up is that they will own property or own a small business, or uh, if they could, a large business, a corporation. And this is not the goal, you know, of French workers or British workers. I, I, I think we don't, you know, understand that, that how settler colonialism uh, kills the possibility of um, worker solidarity. And uh, it's, and then, you know, of course, how the unions were structured as business unions with their own health care plan actually spoiled uh, the possibility of, um, uh, of national health care, which all the European countries and Britain Im immediately, you know, that was the union's demand uh, in those places. And uh, here it was business unions. So they have an interest, you know, in their health plans and making money. They they lobby against um, uh, Obamacare, you know, the public option, uh, because their unions are actually business unions, they're corporations. And so, but we have to have a workers movement. There are workers, they're workers. I mean, they, but this gets to consciousness. And I think that's what the left refuses to deal with, you know, the materialism. They also have the use the European template for organizing without, you know, dealing with settler colonialism, just simply not knowing the history of the United States. Very brilliant leftists, you know, some with PhDs and law degrees and, or even workers, you know, highly sophisticated, uh, do not, uh, you know, do not understand. You, you cannot change a society if you do not know every detail of its structure. So I do think there's a, and even Marx says this, at, at certain points um, in, you know, in uh, trying to develop any kind of real change, uh, you know, towards socialism, that ideology becomes uh, central. And I think we that's where we are and that's what the left won't deal with. You know, they think they have to patronize white workers, um, you know, in fact, workers, the image people see when they say the word workers is a white man. And that's based on, you know, that the good jobs and factories were all given to white men with unions and not the Mexican migrant worker, not the Filipino migrant worker, um, not the, um, you know, the uh, Amazon warehouse workers, fortunately, they're trying to form a union uh, and only recently have, you know, service work. It's that there is organizing there, but it's still in this template of the business union. You know, there's no, uh, let's say, IWW concept, you know, of, uh, of uh, or syndicate no syndicalism, uh, which most countries have, you know, they're syndicates. So 
I think we, you know, there's no way to change a society without the, you know, the majority of the population. Uh, and if we, one thing about Trump is that we could start counting heads, you know, who, who, who's a hard core that we're probably not going to be able to change unless we rip them out of their, uh, out of their uh, settings when they're before they're 12 years old, <laughs> which I, I think, you know, we should try to do, <laughs> or at least teenagers uh, organize them out of, you know, the situations they're in, instead of letting the evangelicals get them or the white nationalists uh, in these, you know, white communities. Uh, but I think, I, I think we, you know, the left is very, um, and it's even hard to say there's a unified left, but the many lefts that I know about, and you know, I've experienced many and been in some, and um, I mean, you know, in some of the organizations and over time and at the present, and um, I see what's lacking is, is uh, you know, the, a lot of analysis gets done. I worked with a... Um, a group in the 1990s, some of whom, you know, out of that is one, you know, Black Lives Matter really came out of those, uh, uh, out of those you know, really intensive um, um, meetings, uh, discussions and presentations. But I was a single person. I wasn't the only person dwelling on anti-imperialism. Most of the, you know, Mexican um, Mexican Americans uh, involved were certainly, uh, and Filipinos and others. But, but the, but talking about settler colonialism is a different thing than anti anti imperialism, and um, understanding the history of the country. And it just didn't, um, you know. I haven't found a way on the left. I can go talk to you know college students and. I think you know they they actually uh, get it and and but we need we need people committed to uh, on the left who committed people you know who who really commit our lives to making change um, that these are the people that that need to um, take it on you know and really look clearly at U.S. history and not keep, you know, um, uh, substantiating what they are already, you know, have as a template for how you organize. And I honestly don't hear many people even talking about revolution anymore, or actually, you know, the United States seems to be falling apart on its own, but we don't really have a, a plan you know, other than some people, I think erroneously and stupidly uh, are buying guns, you know, more guns is not gonna be the answer to this um, structural problems that we have and, you know, that we have to dismantle. Um, it, it would be nice, you know, if it were, were that simple, but it's going to take mass movements. And um, like we saw last summer, and that was very focused on one thing and it was important for that, but we can do that with, you know, with climate change. Uh, I think we can build um, a left, you know, that, that gets educated about the history of the United States and combine that with uh, the catastrophe that's ahead if we don't make change and to name capitalism and, and not just name it, but break it down, how it works, uh, not put an adjective in front of it, financial capitalism, disaster capitalism, or this or that capital. It's just capitalism, you know? It's not, because that implies it can be improved. You know? <laughs> and it can't. It wore out any, you know, I never agreed with Marx that it had its role, you know, in, in creating... Uh, levels of production. Uh, I never agreed with that. I think we would have been better off had capitalism never been invented, um, and, or there would have been no imperialism if there hadn't been capitalism. They were tied together, and that was the uh, you know the what they call the uh, 
primitive accumulation of capital was the looting of the Americas. So um, this is, you know, how it was made possible. And I, I think that um, there's just a, you know, a hopelessness that has to be overcome, not with optimism, but with, with um, determination, you know, to, to figure it out. You know, it's not that, it's not really that hard to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a that's a great note for us to wrap up on. That is world renowned historian and activist, uh, author Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, um, author of many books, including "Not a Nation of Immigrants," "Settler Colonialism," "White Supremacy," and "A History of Erasure," "A History of Erasure and Exclusion." Out now with Beacon Press, which everyone should go check out. Uh, Roxanne, thank you so much for taking this time to talk with me and sharing your brilliance so generously. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Max. It, uh, it's such a pleasure because you have a real life experiences that, you know, that, that, that you bring to the questions that made a very rich conversation. Well, thank you. It was really an honor to have you on. And I hope we can uh, have more conversations in the future, but I know I've yes. taken up more than enough of your time today. So again, thank you so much for joining me and for everyone watching. This is Maximilian Alvarez for The Real News Network. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. Thank you so much for watching.